Hauri alumni and Cassandre Bouvier became friends in Paris while studying at the Sorbonne. The girls were passionate about the cultures of other countries, especially Latin America, so they studied the history, social and political movements, and culture of the region. Horia, who was born in Morocco, was 24 years old. After completing her thesis on Argentina, she decided to put aside her books and visit the country she had written about. Cassandra, at the age of 29, was no stranger to traveling the world, so she gladly accepted her friend's invitation. The girls packed their suitcases and embarked on a journey through the countries of South America, Central America, and the Caribbean Basin. In July 2011, the friends arrived in Salta. It is a province located in the northwest of Argentina with a very interesting geographical, social, and historical repertoire. The landscapes range from snow-capped peaks in the west to plains with a tropical dry climate in the east. The architecture includes churches and cathedrals built during the colonial period, ideal for exploration and study by curious students. However, it is worth noting that, like many provinces in the north of the country and probably throughout Latin America, Salta maintains conservative customs. The influence of the Catholic Church on people's daily lives is significant, and the differences between social classes are pronounced. Politics is controlled by a few influential families who have held power for decades. It is important to mention that as this story unfolds, things will become clearer shortly. On July 15, Cassandra and Horia checked into a hotel in Salta, and set out to explore the sites without unpacking their belongings, as they planned to return to Buenos Aires. Salta is a popular province among tourists, known for its low crime rate and friendly population, especially towards tourists. The main attraction in Salta, is the natural reserve called Quebrada de San Lorenzo. At exactly 1623 on July 15, the girls purchased tickets to visit the reserve. They decided not to hire a guide and ventured deep into the forest. From Buenos Aires, they were supposed to contact their families and inform them of the next city they planned to visit. However, no word was heard from them. On the 19th, unable to bear the uncertainty, their families reached out to Cassandra and Horia's acquaintances in Argentina and asked them to contact the police. Two weeks later, a group of tourists from a neighboring town embarked on the same trail as the French girls. They arrived at the reserve quite late in the evening, but it was not unusual in this area. Around 1800 hours, one of the tourists separated from the group to find a secluded spot in the dense undergrowth. There, he noticed something resembling a body. Approaching and confirming that it was indeed a body, he screamed and rushed back to the group to inform them of his discovery. The police arrived at the reserve around 10 p.m. The tourists had not marked the exact location where they found the body, only mentioning that it was near a viewpoint. Therefore, in the darkness and amidst the dense vegetation, the police initially struggled to locate it. Eventually, they found the body, but before they could begin their work, they discovered two more victims just a few meters away. It turned out to be the two missing French tourists. The police developed several theories, including the possibility that the girls were accidentally shot by a local hunter, as many residents in the area hunt for food. Therefore, the search focused on local residents. The police arrested Francisco Tejeda, who worked as a horseback riding guide for tourists. However, he was released just a few days later as there was no evidence connecting him to the crime. His wife told the press that her husband was arrested solely because they were poor people. The police needed a scapegoat to appease public opinion. Immediately after the discovery of the bodies, the police shared with the press that they had been lying in the forest for about three days. Since the girls had kept their tickets to the reserve for the 15th, various theories arose about what could have happened to them during the remaining days when they were reported missing. It was speculated that they might have been kidnapped, held captive somewhere, and then disposed of. However, the police later clarified that the girls were killed 14 days prior, and they had been lying in the reserve near the viewpoint all that time. Due to Cassandra's torn clothing and Yuri's pants and underwear being pulled down to her knees, 
speculations about violence against the girls emerged. The autopsy confirmed this. The tourists were severely beaten, sexually assaulted, and then shot with a .22 caliber firearm. In the reserve, the police found a corresponding shell casing. They concluded that the girls had managed to take a walk and returned to the entrance of the reserve. There were few visitors at that time, the sun was setting, and the weather was not conducive to late walks. Obviously, it was then that the perpetrator or perpetrators approached their victims, with one attacker assaulting Cassandra. After the violence inflicted upon her, the girl was shot in the head while kneeling before her killer. Uria, who witnessed Cassandra's murder, decided not to give up too easily. A clump of hair remained in her clenched fist, indicating her struggle with at least one assailant. Then, according to investigators' assumptions, the girl dashed down the slope from the height when she was caught by a bullet. It hit her in the back, passing through her shoulder. The culprits left, believing that Uriah was also finished. However, she was still alive and attempted to crawl back to the trail. Nevertheless, her attempts were unsuccessful as she was too weak and endured several more hours of agony before succumbing to blood loss. The investigators examined the girl's hotel room and found only one phone among their belongings, instead of the expected two. By determining the location of Yuria's phone, they discovered that a local girl named Maria Fernanda Canizares, the daughter of a former police officer, was using it. They also found Yuria's camera in her possession. The girl claimed that these were gifts from her boyfriend, Gustavo Lossi. Gustavo, 23 years old, worked as a guide in the reserve, and his father sold tickets to tourists. It was Gustavo who had offered his services to the French girls, but they declined. Gustavo had changed the SIM card in the phone, thinking that would be enough to avoid detection. Not immediately, but Gustavo Lossi confessed to being present at the crime scene and participating in the violence. However, he claimed that he was not the instigator or the killer of the French girls but merely a witness. He recounted that upon hearing noise and running to the screams, he witnessed two men, 24-year-old Daniel Vilt, a stonemason, and 31-year-old Santos Clemente Vera, a gardener from the San Lorenzo Plain, tormenting the girls. Supposedly, these men coerced him into participating in the violence and then allowed him to leave. However, he didn't forget to take the girl's phone and camera with him. However, during a search of Gustavo's home, the police discovered the weapon that fired the fatal shots. Uria's camera helped the police establish the exact time of the attack on the French girls. The girls were enjoying sightseeing and took several photos just before embarking on a hike through the reserve. Two hours and five minutes later, at 6.28 pm, the tourists took their last photo, which turned out blurry and unclear, allowing investigators to speculate that the attack occurred precisely at that moment. All three men were charged with murder. Witnesses immediately came forward, pointing to Vilt as the person who attempted to sell a rifle. However, he had a solid alibi as he was at a bank during the time of the attack and could prove it. In 2014, Gustavo Lossi was sentenced to 30 years in prison, while Vera was released, due to insufficient evidence, and his denial of guilt. He also claimed to have an alibi. However, the prosecutor demanded a review of the case, and in 2016, both men were sentenced to life imprisonment. It seemed that one of the most high-profile cases in Argentine history had reached its conclusion. But no, the story doesn't end there. French journalist Jean Charles Chattard dedicated four years to his own investigation of this case and wrote a book presenting his arguments as to why the girls couldn't have been killed in the nature reserve on July 15, as the investigators claim. The journalist is convinced that the girls didn't die in the reserve, their bodies were simply brought there after the murder. Firstly, even after a short walk in the reserve, his shoes were covered in dust and dirt, unlike the victim's shoes. The girls couldn't have taken such a path, then endured violence, fought for their lives, and still had clean shoes. Secondly, the appearance of the tourists, in general, was strange. 
their clothing was more suited for an evening event in the city rather than a hike in the nature reserve. The next strange thing, is that the bodies lay in Quebrada de San Lorenzo for two weeks. The reserve is a wild, open area inhabited by pumas, foxes, and condors. After such a period, the police could have found completely gnawed bones. However, the bodies were discovered without a single bite mark. Not to mention that they were lying in a popular reserve near a frequently visited viewpoint. Finally, the pathologist who examined the bodies confidently stated that they were killed three to a maximum of five days before the autopsy. Regarding the date of the murders, the doctor is categorical and indicated in the report that it was July 26, 2011. Remarkably, the judge who led the investigation changed this date to July 15. Could it be possible that the judge intentionally manipulated the facts to protect someone? Could the judge intentionally tamper with evidence? Was he trying to protect someone? This is exactly what Nestor Piccolo, the commissioner in charge of the investigation, was convinced of, and it may have cost him his life. Commissioner Piccolo died under mysterious circumstances four months after the start of the investigation. He was found at the entrance of the commissioner's office, with a bullet in his head. His mother stated that it was her son's decision, but she is certain that he was killed, and it was an execution. No traces of gunpowder were found on Nestor's hands, and before his death, he was working on a new version. According to Clemente Vera, he is innocent, and Gustavo Lossi is simply an accomplice of the real criminals, representatives of the upper classes of the province. Nicholas's investigation worried many people who wanted to hide the truth, including the judge and the influential local families could not allow the light to be shed on the deaths of the French girls. However, this conspiracy of silence was interrupted in April 2014 by an anonymous letter describing the same trail that Commissioner Piccolo was investigating. The letter was sent to the victims' families in France. Chattard received a copy of it and pursued this lead. The anonymous letter was handwritten by a woman who chose not to sign it out of fear of testifying in court. Chattard spent several months, but eventually found a witness. It turned out to be a girl who is often in the company of a small circle of influential individuals in Salta. She knew that on July 15, 2011, the two tourists couldn't have been killed in the nature reserve because they were invited to a party organized by the city's wealthy youth. She paints a completely different picture of what happened. At such parties, alcohol flows freely, and everything resembles a movie, but it's all happening in real life. According to the girl, Cassandra and Uriah were among the guests and were seen near the pool. As the evening progressed and more drinks were consumed, the men became increasingly interested in the attractive French women. Around 3 a.m., they led them inside the house, and no one saw them after that. The guys started harassing one of the tourists. Of course, she refused, but her opinion no longer mattered to the men, and things went too far. Her friend witnessed what happened, so the guys decided to kill both of them to prevent the truth from being revealed. However, they didn't rush. They tortured the victims for several days before finally killing them. The witness provided the exact location where this supposedly happened, a villa in the most fashionable district of the city, Buena Vista, where deputies, ministers, and wealthy foreigners reside. The villa is usually not occupied permanently as it is often rented out for private parties. There is also a pool, which is where the French women were last seen. But the most intriguing part is the villa's location, right beneath where the bodies were found. Behind the house, there is a hidden path leading to the lookout point of the nature reserve. If everything happened as the witness claims, the bodies of the girls were carried under the cover of night, taken through that path, and left in the dense undergrowth of the reserve. However, how could such a wild scenario, unfolding at a party in plain sight, remain a secret for so long? The witness claims that it can be explained by the terror imposed by the real criminals on anyone who dares to speak up. According to her, the party was organized by the son of a deputy, who attacked the French woman. When she tried to escape, he severely beat her. 
Two other sons of the politician were also involved in the assault and later in the murder. Today, the deputy's face calmly looks down from numerous billboards during his latest election campaign. By the way, one of his sons followed in his father's footsteps and became a politician as well. He politician refused to comment on these allegations, but one judge who presided over the initial investigation showed a great interest in the story described in the anonymous letter. He believes that it contains everything necessary to achieve justice. However, the judge who took over the case afterward had no intention of seeking other culprits. He believes that the family must be very influential to manipulate the police, and he attributes the deaths of the French women to the provincial justice system. The new version gives more weight to the witness's story, according to which he saw the two French women leaving the nature reserve on July 15. This means that the crime could have occurred in a different place and at a different time than what the investigators insist on. As for the blurred photograph supposedly taken during the attack in the nature reserve, Cassandra's father, Jean-Michel Bouvier, submitted the photo to an expert who believes that it has been manipulated using a photo editing program. The angle of the shot and the lighting cannot be as depicted in the photograph. In France, the victims' families no longer expect anything from the justice system. Jean-Michel Bouvier conducted an independent DNA analysis on his daughter's body. DNA from Gustavo Lossi and two other male individuals, as well as one female DNA, were found on the most intimate parts. There was no trace of Clemente Vera's sample. The ownership of the other samples remains unknown, raising questions about the identities of the other individuals involved in the attack on the girls and the true role of Gustavo Lossi. Meanwhile, in the heart of San Lorenzo, a few hundred meters from the place where Cassandra and Uriah's bodies were found, there still stands the modest home of Clemente Vera's parents. After their son's arrest, they struggle to make ends meet, as they are unable to work the land or care for animals in their advanced age. Clemente's parents, his wife, and many local residents believe in his innocence. They believe that his only fault is living close to the crime scene, and not having the means to afford lawyers. It is especially sad considering that nothing in the case files connects him to the crime. He claims that the police beat him and threatened him and his child, demanding a confession to the murder. When he refused to comply, they ransacked his house in search of any incriminating evidence, but they were unsuccessful. In connection with this, in 2017, Santos Clemente Vera filed a complaint with the Supreme Court of Argentina, and in June 2020, he was granted permission for a case review. He hopes that a new trial will be conducted, during which he will be acquitted. Interestingly, Cassandra's father is convinced of his innocence. He witnessed all the hearings, traveled to Argentina multiple times to learn the details of the case, and conducted his own investigation, concluding that Vera did not commit the crime. Therefore, he visited Vera in prison, apologized to him, and then started a social media campaign for his release. Bouvier is concerned that the case review is taking an endlessly long time, while an innocent person continues to sit in prison in Salta. On November 25, 2013, on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, a monument was solemnly unveiled in memory of Cassandra and Uriah. Alfredo Garzon, a sculptor from Salta who lived in Paris, responded to Jean-Michel Bouvier's request to take on this work. By depicting an outstretched hand, eyes, and the face with an anguished expression, Alfredo managed to create a very powerful image conveying the pain, horror, and suffering that the girls went through. The sculpture is located in the San Lorenzo ravine, where the victims' bodies were found.